Every Night is Game Night, episode 53, Gen Con Review Rapid Fire, part one. Hey guys, welcome back to Every Night is Game Night. This is episode 53. Once again with you, this is Anthony with Jason. Yo, my peoples, what's up? Hey guys, we are back with tons of reviews for you. So many reviews, so many games. So many reviews. So the last few weeks, we've been doing lots of cool stuff. We've Jason put together these roundtables and these interviews, doing all this amazing th- stuff while I'm over here fighting with my kids, getting them back to school. Um, and going to Gen Con. Don't be... <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll trade. <laughs> um, I'm trying to... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so we haven't actually had a chance to sit down and review some games in a little bit of time. Uh, so A, that means we have a bit of a backlog. And B, that means rapid fire. We're yes, going to do this. all the games. Uh, so we're going to knock out seven today. We have seven games we're going to talk about today. And, and then next week, if you do not hear something this week that you think we should have talked about, tune in next week because we'll have seven more. Uh, so we have lots and lots of games we've been playing here the last month or two, and we're going to share them all with you along with our opinions. Yeah, uh, and uh, a little bit of note about these games. Uh, so this is Gen Con uh, and area type games, and the Gen Con releases tend to be a little bit on the lighter side. Um, which doesn't necessarily mean thematic side. <laughs> so I, not quite the party that it might be for me, but definitely, you know, these are lighter. These are kind of two way between two and three. Uh, lots of dice rolling, lots of randomness, lots of, you know, um, fun and, and, you know, fun for the family kind of thing. Uh, stay tuned for Essen, where we will have heavy games and we'll let Anthony off his leash and have fun. Woo! Yeah! I hope so. <laughs> so here's the thing, though, about Essen is I want that to be the case, but I'm not going to Essen. So. Someone better bring these games back. Yes. If you're listening to this and you're there, bring it back. <laughs> bring it back. <laughs> Packs Unplugged. Meet us, at, meet us over there. We'll both be there. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's the hope. We get to play these, some of these games at Packs Unplugged. We'll bring them out to you. All the Euros. All the Euros. That's my dream. But All right. Well, until then, we have real-time cooperative goodness for you. Uh, two games, actually, that will lead us off. Uh, Anthony's going to start with Paramedics Clear. All right. So Paramedics Clear is... Exactly what it sounds like. You are a paramedic. You are trying to save your patients. This is a real-time game. It's not cooperative at all. It comes from Smirk and Dagger Games. So if you oh, know, that's you, my game is cooperative. Your game is Smirk and Dagger. Exactly. <laughs> so I actually asked him, I think when we originally talked to him about it at Origins, like, oh, is this cooperative? And he just laughed at me like, we don't do cooperative games. Like, of course you don't. You're Smirk and Dagger. Um, but it seems like it could be, right? But right. The, the basic idea of the game is you are going to get these patient cards on every turn and you have to play different uh, cards, these little miniature cards you're going to have. And all they are is like different colored medical boxes, but you have to combine them in certain ways to form the blood and the medicine and the casts and the different things you need to either stabilize your patients or to get them to the hospital completely. So each of the patient cards has multiple of these icons on it. For to keep them alive in any given round, you have to put at least one uh, item on them. If you want to get them to the hospital, you have to put all the items on them. The trick is you only have a small amount of time in which to do that. So the game comes with this app. The app has basically it's just an egg timer with either 60, 45 or 30 seconds. But the egg timer is very noisy and very obnoxious and it stresses you out and it's supposed to. so I think when it starts, there's like a siren sound. And then the entire time it's going, it's got the beep, beep, beep. And it gets faster towards the end. So no pressure. The goal of the game, though, is to be able to stabilize all your guys, get as many of the hospital as you can, manage this stuff in those 60 seconds, and then pass it along to the next player. The solo version of the game, there is no passing along to the second player. So you're just trying to get as much as you've done as much done as you can in one deck. So each, basically each shift of the game, and there's three shifts, is getting through the entire deck once. So a solo player, you're going to play through that shift one time. I usually do a 60 seconds. You could do down to 30 seconds if you want, but that's just that much more stressful. And you're just trying to go for a high score. The game is quick. It's chaotic. It's actually a lot of fun to play with other people. I'm not a huge fan of the solo mode. Uh, it's basically a challenge mode. It's, the main difference between the solo and the full game is that 
A, it's a little bit longer with the full game, but B, you're passing along cards to people um, that they don't know what it is. So when they start their shift, this card pops up and they're like, ah, I don't have the stuff for this. In the solo mode, you're just drawing randomly from the deck. So it's the same idea, but it's not quite the same interaction. It's fine. It's just, I'm not a huge fan of sitting there in my office playing this game with this random noise just shooting out at me. Like, I don't need the stress, <laughs> you know? Um, I like the idea of a kind of strategic party style game that takes some thinking when with a group of people, not necessarily by myself. So not a huge fan of playing it solo, but I do like it quite a bit for playing with other people. So if that's the kind of game that sounds interesting to you, there is that for you. The solo game doesn't really offer enough, at least in terms of real time. There's a couple other real time games I like better, like Dungeon Time, um, but it's not a horrible game. It's just not perfect in a solo setting. All right. Uh, speaking of medical drama, and this time it is a cooperative medical drama, which is what medical drama should be, right? You shouldn't be stabbing each other in the back while you're treating patients. What's going on here? Well, I mean, I don't... That's... It's smirk and dagger. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> that's what they do. Anyway, so this is uh, this game is Flatline. Uh, it is designed by Kane Klenko and published by Renegade Games. So uh, this game is, like I was saying, a cooperative game. It is a sequel to Fuse. Uh, it's called a flatline, a fused aftershock game, which I'm guessing that's just for branding. <laughs> you know, like it has a similar look and it has real a real time dice element, but that's basically it. Like, like this game is kind of really its own game, in a, in a, in some significant ways. Uh, so what is it? You are an emergency medical team, and your goal is to cure all the patients who come into the ER, and you're doing it pretty quickly. So each patient is represented by an oversized card, and this card has rows of symbols. And you also have a personal set of dice, like six dice, and these dice also have symbols. So you're going to be matching the symbols on the dice to the symbols on the patients, which in a way that is fused, right? You're matching the, the dice to the, the bomb card. So this one, you're matching the dice to the patients, but there's way more going on than that. So unlike the paramedic clear though, and unlike, unlike fuse, not the entire game is not timed. So you have a planning phase, which you look at the whole board, you take it all in, and you figure out, okay, what is the most the, the stuff that has to get dealt with the most? You're kind of triaging, right? Uh, and then you get your time to roll the dice. So you roll your custom dice. Everyone else is rolling their custom dice. And you assign the dice as quickly as you can, realizing that you don't have – you're never going to have enough dice to deal with all the crises that are happening. So along with the patients, there's like all this other stuff going on. So there's like emergency cards. The uh, power went out. Uh, one of the interns fell asleep. <laughs> I think that's a real card. Like an intern fell asleep. You have to put a dice on him, like put a little syringe, stick him in the butt and <laughs> wake him up. Uh, so so you're constantly figuring out, okay, what is the immediate emergency? How many dice can I spare to actually treat these patients? Uh, and then you have to figure all that out. In a, like you have to actually do it in a minute. So you can plan it out. But then once you roll the dice, once they hit the table, boom, you got a minute. Let's do it. Uh, so... There's a ways to do mitigate the rolling. It's not just you're at the mercy of the dice. You do have to sacrifice a dice in order to be able to re-roll the rest of them. That's about as much as you get. For the most part, you're you're stuck with what you got <laughs> unless you do that re-roll thing, which isn't that great an option. Uh, so you just have to do the best that you can, basically. Uh, and that's it. You go through basically you know, it's about seven rounds of this. There's ways to increase the rounds to give you more time to cure the patients, but you have to cure all the patients. If you don't cure all the patients, you lose. If you don't take care of enough emergencies, you lose. So there's a ton of ways to lose here as well. Uh, solo, very simple. You're just playing two characters. Uh, you're, you're rolling two sets of dice and you're just doing the same thing that you would in cooperative. So, you know, basically, you know, it's, it's kind of the same game. Uh. <laughs> so I, I really like Fuse. I wanted to like this game. I think it's okay. I think it's a pretty good game. If this is the first, if this is your first exposure to real time, you know, games and you know, stress and interaction, I think it's a good introduction. But I got the feeling that I was playing like a more complicated version of a game that didn't need to be more complicated. So Fuse is a really simple game. I really like it. It's a nice filler type thing to take at a game night. Kind of in a way that King of Tokyo is a nice, cool filler. But then they gave you King of New York, which is the more complicated gamery version of that. And that's, I don't think, is as good. I'll just play King of Tokyo. If I want to play a more complicated version of a game, I'll just play a more complicated game. There's millions of examples out there. So this game, uh, on the solo especially, I think the multiplayer is is better. Uh, you have more patience, but there's more dice on the table. So there's all, you know, 
Uh, I mean, you could roll all four dice as a solo. I do not recommend that whatsoever. Uh, but with the more dice, there's more interaction, there's more places to put the dice, and I think there's more to do, so to speak, in solo. I didn't even use the timer. Like, the decisions were obvious enough where I just kind of place, 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 and I never hit the timer, so after a while, I just kind of stopped bothering with it. So as a solo, if that sounds good to you, and but you, you're kind of put off by the timer, it's not as impactful at solo. Um, but you're still kind of at the mercy of the dice, and it's a big, chunky game to have that much randomness there. Uh, and if I'm going to play a really random dice rolling game, I need it to be short. Uh, or to have more mitigation, like a one-deck dungeon or something like that. This one... Uh, plus the theme is abstract as all heck. <laughs> uh, th- these these patients are these giant oversized cardboard cards. They don't feel like patients at all. I almost think like Pandemic Vicura has more theme, which it says a lot. Because that game barely has any theme. Uh, and I think Pandemic and the Cures, honestly, I have more fun with it. So, again, you might enjoy it because this is one of your first games. You might get into the theme or the look or whatever it is. Uh, for me, it's it's okay. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> I wish I had be- a better thing to say about that, but that's, you know, got to be honest over here. So that is Flatline by Renegade Games. Wow, oh, man. Starting off strong. <laughs> so uh we didn't uh, maybe i did this a little bit on purpose but we uh this is uh the we're starting off with you know some you know our games that we thought were okay but then we're gonna end off with a bang so you you guys just stay tuned yes yeah these aren't all games we dislike um <laughs> uh next one up here for me is deckscape this is from dv gyoki and it is a well it's an escape room it's just yet another one of these escape room style games This one's a little bit different in that it is a single deck of cards. Uh, There is no app involved. There is no destruction of the game. Um, So it kind of sits somewhere between unlock and exit in terms of like your approach to the game. You open up the box, single deck of cards, boom, that's all you need. The game itself, however, you're building out a tableau of clues and things you have to solve, turning over cards one at a time. Um, It is similar in a lot of ways to exit, but there really isn't that interactivity of the puzzles. Um, you know, there's nothing tactile going on. You're not doing anything. And then there's not really that same option of failure. Uh, in Exit, for example, if you guess wrong, you check the cards, you basically get additional chances. And then you have these other options kind of to help you kind of push your way forward. It, you know, impacts your score, but uh, it gives you a few options in terms of what to do next. In this one, if you fail, you've already seen the answer and you just kind of move on from there. Um, so it gets a little anticlimactic at times. Now the game does integrate that. It's not just, you know, oh, you know the answer now, let's move on. But it's not as interesting as the way Exit does it or the way Unlock handles those types of things. The game overall, it's well written. It's well produced. I do like the single deck mechanism. Uh, you can just pull it out and play the game almost instantly. The rules are just on the cards. There's no rule book. You just go. And there's no app as well. So there's no like dependence on a phone. There's no time limit. You just play the game. Um, I just, despite all that, I don't feel like it's quite as good as either of those other games. Uh, You know, with Unlock, you have, it does feel like you're solving these puzzles to get out of this space. You're doing a thing to complete a goal. This one, you are just solving a series of puzzles and they're light, light, light story kind of layered on top. But it's not really that, like, you're not escaping a thing. You're not solving an overarching thing. You're just going from puzzle to puzzle. All those things are fun to me. If this was the only escape room game I'd ever played, I would think, wow, this is great. This is a lot of fun. And it might even be one of the better ones for people just getting into these types of games because it is just puzzle, 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 solve the story, you're done. Um, It doesn't have these extra layers of things added on like these other games do, and there's no rule book. Again, you can just start playing right away. But... If you were to ask me which of these I enjoy the most, it's not this one. It doesn't it doesn't replace for me these other games. Now, is it worth playing? Yeah, probably, because you still have, you know, each of these games can, can be played once, probably, before you don't want to play it anymore. So you might as well add it to the rotation. But when you consider that there are three new unlocks coming out in the next six months and like seven new exits coming out in the next year, I'm not sure we need extra depth added to this chart i have plenty of these types of games coming up um so yeah deckscape interesting it's good there's nothing wrong with it i like the way it uses a single deck and there's no rule book but it is 
not quite as good as the other games. Yeah, and you know, like what we're saying with some of the games we were reviewing, I, I don't want to come off as sounding like downers. These are good games. Um, they're good games if you're just getting started. But you mean you got it? Like Anthony and I played so many games, <laughs> uh, and we have a large piles of games, and we're, we're real dorks about it, and it's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're comparing stuff, and so I, in comparison, these games might you know come up a little bit short, but. Um, you know, it, in the aggregate, you know, I think these games, you, they're, they're worth your time if you're interested in those types of games. So I'm going to kind of actually play off of that a little bit. Um, and, you know, if it, it basically like, you know, if a game is, if it was going to stand out, then you either need to like just be better or just kind of do something really interesting that hasn't been done before. So I'm going to talk about a game that actually does that, which is Escape from 100 Million B.C., this game was designed by Kevin Wilson. You may remember that name from Descent and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, lots of dice rolling goodness, and you're going to get more dice rolling here. Uh, and it's published by IDW Games. So this is an adventure game with a big, big board. You, this, this board is enormous. Uh, it is Eldrick's horror size, so it's not just the board. It is rows of cards in the side. It is player mats. It is tokens. It is just a big, you know, big family-sized thing. It is a cooperative game for one to six players. Never, ever play this with more than four. There is so much downtime between the terms. You, the players have nothing to do in between people's turns. So, you know, if you're going to play with a lot of people, pair up. <laughs> you know, uh, so, you know, I'm not really sure why they went it all the way to six, but whatever. It's a big board. You guys, six people fit around the board, so they just put it on one to six. Anyway, so this is kind of a... Uh, it gave me, speaking of El Char, it gave me that feel of just going around to different spots and doing stuff and getting into adventures, pulling from an event deck, having random things happen. But as opposed to that dirty C word, <laughs> you know, CTH word or whatever it is, which may come up a little bit later, uh, this game is a time travel game. So you are uh, time travel and something has gone wrong and you land among the dinosaurs. So your ship has broken up. In, this, in space and land it and spit out a bunch of parts so you have to explore the whole map which the map is basically a bunch of hex tiles you have to explore one by one recover your parts recover your equipment bring them back so pick up and deliver you're going out you're picking up stuff you're bringing it back so some wrinkles uh first you can encounter dinosaurs yes uh and the dinosaurs aren't just your usual triceratops brontosaurus the things that you've heard of there's a lot of different dinosaurs aquatic dinosaurs flying ones uh, if you're a dinosaur geek, you might actually get a lot out of this game because it's, you know, pretty cool. I don't know. Maybe they're making it up, but it looks good to me. <laughs> uh, the second thing is not only did you go back in time, you have also opened like little temporal rifts and you're pulling other people back in time as well. So you're pulling back Abraham Lincoln. You're pulling back Amelia Earhart. You're pulling back Socrates. You're pulling back all these people from all different points in time and if they like they're going to be walking around the board at the same time as these dinosaurs and if the dinosaurs get at these people then you have disrupt the space time continuum and which basically means you go up a track there's a track on the outside of the board which is your instability meter if too many bad things happen then you're going to lose the game if one of these time travelers uh dies to a um dies to what you call it a, a thing then you're going to lose the game uh if a dinosaur a thing pff, dinosaurs man uh if a um if you shoot a dinosaur like let's say one attacks you and you just shoot it with your gun or whatever that's gonna <laughs> put, go up in the paradox meter lots of ways to kind of mess with the, the quote-unquote space time continuum but they all kind of collapse into this one bad thing meter and if you fill up that meter then you lose the game you win the game by picking up all your parts by putting the um the time travelers back into their home space which basically means you go to their hacks you do Talk to them and you bring them back. Uh, so that's what you're doing. Mechanically, it is a very dice rolly skill checky affair. So you, the, everything is a skill check. Fighting the monsters is a skill check against your brawn. Uh, convincing the time travelers to come with you is a check against your charisma or whatever it is, your interaction skill. Uh, you know, there's will skill. There's all sorts of these skills and you're just rolling, rolling, rolling. Nothing happens in this game without a bunch of rolls. And so you're trying to like leverage which roles go where and you're trying to leverage, you know, okay, this person's going to go convince the thing because they have high intelligence or high charisma or I have an item that will take care of this monster. So I'm going to take care of the monster. You go escort, you know, um, time travelers. 
So you're playing off of that, but at the end of the day, there's just not a lot of strategic mitigation of all this stuff. You're you're dice rolling. You're enjoying the story. You're enjoying, um, you know, all these different historical figures getting assaulted by dinosaurs. You're enjoying the theme. Uh, I did. So I'm going to give this game a recommendation, but like a conditional one, because you have to enjoy the theme. You have to be able to get into that mind space of cool things happening. You have to be able to just roll dice and just kind of let go of, you know, the, that strategic thinking. It's like, oh, that didn't work out. Uh, it's not bad when you lose rolls. I mean, there's you, you don't really die. You just kind of like go back to the middle space and just kind of you know do it again. So, you know, it's, it's light. It's fun. It's family friendly. Uh, it has a lot of tools to bring the theme and the weirdness to life the all the different events that happen so i appreciate that it's not definitely not a pasted on theme they really worked hard at bringing some of this wacko stuff to life so i appreciate it on that end it not going to offer anything mechanically rich so if you're that kind of solo player this might be a pass for you um and if you're solo you're playing two characters which eh, whatever uh, people complain about that. It doesn't this? It's not better here, but it's fine. Uh, if you like it, it it, it works for you. Uh, so that's you know that's my conditional recommendation. I had fun with it. I'm probably gonna keep it around. If I you know get into a situation where I have a bunch of kids who love dinosaurs, we're gonna go time travel and we're gonna go recovering pieces and away we go. Uh, Anthony, unless you're playing with your kids, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that does not sound interesting to me at all. But... <laughs> Is your kid listening in the background? Hey. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. He doesn't need to hear about this. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Cover the mic. <laughs> like, yeah, this is a dinosaur game. Like, no, no, it's not out yet. <laughs> it's um, really, I think it's really good. I think it's, and, and for that, it scratches a particular itch. It doesn't go beyond its lane. Um, but in its lane, I think it's pretty effective. That is Escape from 100 Million BC by IDW Games. All right. Well, moving away from... Uh, anything thematic right. and <laughs> yeah man put me to sleep <laughs> let's do it let's put jason to sleep guys um we have caverna cave versus cave this was early released at origins i was not able to get one of the 50 copies they had so i was able to pick this up later at gen con it came out over the summer and it is caverna super light edition uh uve has a, a habit of taking his big heavy games and turning them into very accessible short clean table-friendly two-player games, and this one has a solo mode. So unlike the full version of Caverna, which takes up all of your space, takes a while to set up, has bits everywhere, I still like it, but it doesn't come out for solo play very often because of all the stuff all over the place. This one is very, very simple. You have a track on the side where you move one bit for each resources up and down the, the number track to keep track of it, and you are basically you're trying to generate these resources on the track, spend them to excavate and then furnish rooms so you have a cave board you're trying to clear out all the tiles that are on each of the spaces of your cave board and then go in and build a room in that space each of these rooms is going to give you some kind of an ability you can access or a passive ability that's going to be there the rest of the game and with these passive abilities and these active abilities that you then activate you will generate new resources do more excavations build more rooms so really, the goal of the game is to get to 50 points if you're playing it solo. Uh, it's decently difficult, but not super hard to do that. If you, For example, if you furnished all nine rooms, you'll win the game, regardless of what those rooms are worth. You'll just do it. But it's not easy to do that. So you need to find the most efficient path there. You need to be able to get multiple rooms excavated and multiple rooms furnished and multiple resource sets at the same time. If you spend an action doing one thing, you're probably not going to be able to get there because you need to be very efficient about this. You only have 19 total turns in the game, which sounds like a lot, but when you consider how little you're actually doing on each of those turns, it adds up pretty fast. So um, the solo mode is not super different uh, from the the two-player version um, because, it, again, it's a, it's a Nuve Rosenberg game, so the interaction in the two-player version is more about what spaces you're taking that the other player can then not take and what tiles are available. Um, it is very interesting because you are very carefully managing when you're placing tiles out and when you're making new things available, when you excavate, things you don't really have to think about in the solo version. But the gameplay itself is pretty much the same. Um, there are a couple tiles removed uh, in terms of actions, so you can't raise the walls, for example, in the solo mode which makes the game a little bit tighter, a little bit more of a careful play. But overall, it's 
it's a very tight, very fun, quick and easy to learn game. Um, it's not really an engine builder, unlike you know a lot of his other games. It's more of a conversion management <laughs> game. I don't know how to. I don't know how best to word it because while you do build somewhat of an engine, you're never really going to chain that many things off of each other. You're not going to be do X, which triggers Y, which triggers Y, and builds all these things. What you're really trying to do is make the most efficient conversions possible. You know, if a tile lets you has two options for conversion, where one is trade in three wheat to get two gold, and the other one is trade in five wheat to get five gold, you want to do the second one every time. And so you're trying to build a system where that's always possible. I always really enjoy that. And the fact that this only plays in about 20 or 30 minutes makes me enjoy it that much more. Um, whereas a game like Fields of Arl or the Cavern of the Full version or uh, my recent favorite, Feast for Odin, those those games take at least an hour to play solo plus setup and breakdown time. This one, you can set it up in five minutes. You can play it in 20. You can put it away in two. Very, very quick. Um, fits in with, like, in terms of wait and time with a lot of the other solo games that I play a lot because I can bring it out and just knock it out real quick and then put it away. So this is a this is a strong game for me. I really enjoy it. I think it's going to be one of the more commonly played Uwe Rosenberg solo games for me just because of how quick I can get it out and play it. I don't think it's the best because it doesn't have as much depth as some of the other ones, but it definitely offers kind of that quick hit, quick fix, um, Euro feel that you, you're not necessarily going to get in the bigger ones. So I, I like it a lot. All right. So we are going to continue with our string of games that we like. So this is my last game for this review. Uh, stay tuned for some more next episode. Uh, but this is Fate of the Elder Gods. Uh, this was designed by Chris Kirkman, Daryl Lauder, and Richard Launius, published by Greater Than Games in their Fabled Nexus line. Uh, to hold on to that thought with Fabled Nexus. We'll get back to them in just a minute. Uh, but this game, Fate of the Elder Gods, a Cthulhu game. Yes, that is the dirty CTH word I was mentioning before. Cthulhu! Um, uh, <laughs> I know Anthony can't wait, but uh, this is very, very different than your standard Cthulhu game. We usually... Think of FFG. Uh, so FFG releases Arkham Heart of the Card Game, which, by the way, people are really loving on the new expansions for that. Uh, we're not going to get into it so much because it's just not our bag. Uh, we like our money. <laughs> um, but you know, not not to rag on that uh, that game at all. People are really, really loving it. So, uh, But it's not that. It is not those games. This game, uh, those are like narrative, cooperative, adventure games with big story and lots of dice rolling, whatever it is. Uh, this game... If I had to think of an equivalent of a, of a game, it's very Blood Rage-ish. So it's not really, like, not really, like, the Blood Rage is really doing a lot of its own thing. But this game really comes close in terms of taking different mechanisms, taking the workers that you place in the board, that they go into zones, and the zones let you, you know, you get control of them, and you do stuff, and you interact with your uh, players, and there's card play, and there's all this different type of stuff which is like combining some elements of euro and some elements of a merit thrash so eric lang called blood rage a merit thr uh, euro thrash game so this game i guess i'd kind of put it in the same situation uh very very you know take borrowing from a lot of different things it's coming up with its own like mix of stuff um so what are you doing so you are not the investigators you are the cultists and you are trying to summon your elder god uh, you are going to do this by taking your little cultist workers and the really cute little cultist meeples, and you're going to sacrifice them. <laughs> you're going to put them in there. You're going to banish them to the void or whatever it is, and that puts you up on a summon track. If you get nine quote-unquote summon points, first you win the game. Very, very simple. Um, so, uh, what do you? So, what else do you have? You have these. You have these little um, cultist meeples. They have like twenty of them, so a lot. Uh, you also have a player mat, which has a power that you can do every once in a while, depending on what's going on. Uh, and you also have a hand of cards. So really this hand, this is a card driven game, right? Just like Blood Rage is at the end of the day, a very complex, but very rich card driven game. So the cards are multi-use. You can either use them for whatever spells are on them. And that's usually text and it does a certain effect, but mostly you're going to use them for their symbol in the back. And the symbol corresponds, it's, these, you know, the, the usual astrological symbols, and they correspond with six spaces on the board. So what you're going to do is you're going to play a card in front of you, and you're going to activate the space on whatever that symbol is. So like if you play a sun, you're going to activate the sun space. 
and then you place your worker there. And if you have a lot of workers there, you more than other people, you get to do like the like a super version of the action. But if you you're just gonna go in there, you get to do like a basic action. The actions are pretty simple. You either get more cultist, you can get artifacts, you can get more spells. You do, you get you do a bunch of stuff. I'm like yada yadding a lot of stuff because I don't want to crowd this rapid fire with a lot of detail. But I want to get to the main core of the game, which is this card play. You're playing a card, you're activating a space, you're placing your worker there, and eventually you're setting up where you get enough resources where you can sacrifice a whole bunch of your minions at once. Boom, bra, you know, <laughs> and you know, shoot up that um, that summon spa- the, the the summon god space. So, and that's dice rolling. So that like I've seen games that have kind of swung. It's like you because it's like a kind of a fifty fifty chance naturally, and you get to mitigate that with with spells and different abilities and such. So. Um, you, you, you might get hosed by the dice and that's just the way it is. So it's a very tactical game. The way the spell system works, there's, you can't always cast your spells. So you have to react to other people. There's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of take that like, oh, you want to do this? Bam. You can't do this no more. You wanted to kill all these cultists, sacrifice your God. Bam. I just killed them. <laughs> you don't get nothing. Uh, it's a very, very interactive game that way. Um, so that is like, that's kind of the core of the game, what you want to do, what you're doing in a particular turn. Uh, again, I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of detail, but that card play, that you know, activating spaces, sacrificing cultists, and doing it in an engine type way, you have to build that engine, you have to be really efficient. Um, solo, the solo game, there's not a lot of interaction. So you can basically do what you want, quote unquote, with the, you know, with the engine, you could build whatever thing you want. If you wanted to do, get a lot of artifacts and win that way, if you wanted to take advantage of certain spaces, it's all open to you. You can just basically, you know, whatever is in your head and whatever, however the cards come to you, you can play them. The one block, and this is also in the multiplayer, but in the solo, it's more, are the investigators. So these little investigator meeples will show up right next to your little cultist meeple. And if you get too many, when you, when you place a worker. When you get too many investigators, they they show up on your player mat. So like they're raiding you. And then if at a certain point, they're just going to raid your lodge and they're going to put anti-victory points, basically elder signs on your sheet. And if you get too many of these elder signs, you just lose. Boom. Done. The game is done. Just add up points after that. Whoever got furthest in the summon track wins if you get all these elder signs. So two ways to win. One, just have a lot of points if somebody gets elder signs. And just fill up your track and do your thing. Solo, you're really just filling up your track. And you're managing these investigators. And in solo, there's a ton of them. So, I really like this game. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it. I was like, just once I got into it, there's kind of a high barrier of entry because there's just a lot going on at once. The spell system is a little bit wonky and hard to kind of grok at the beginning. But once I did, I had a lot of fun. And a solo was just really, really fun. Like, you know, building this engine is fun. Um... It doesn't need Cthulhu to be a good game. Anthony and I were talking before, like you can put any theme where you're just taking workers and you're making use of them and then you're just kind of getting rid of them to score points. Uh, you know, if you're like an evil genius, like, you know, murdering your minions or whatever it is, uh, <laughs> or your what's his face, uh, murdering the minions, maybe not murdering, but like banishing them off. You could just, you could make that game too. Uh, but it happens to be Cthulhu. So it's a Richard Launius game. Richard Launius loved Cthulhu. What are you going to do? Uh, so solo is almost good, <laughs> almost good. It is, um, I love the engine building. I love the, the way it plays. I think there's just, it, it's too easy to get your stuff going. And if you're going to lose in solo, you're going to lose to the roles, which isn't that as satisfying as just, you know, outperforming whatever the game puts in front of you. So, uh, there's a good solo game in this box. And Chris Kirkman has said that the solo development came a little bit later in the larger development of this game when they realized the investigators could be used to enact a solo mode. So I think they're not done. And I think they've said that they're going to post different solo rules on the on the website. So I'm waiting for those. If I get those and they're good, I can really give this a recommendation for the solo player and for the multiplayer. As it is, I think it's an excellent game. I'm keeping it. It's fun. Uh, Does it need Cthulhu to be good? And just really, really good. So that was Rise of the Elder Gods from Greater Than Games. Sounds amazing, minus Cthulhu. <laughs> it's Blood Rage. It ish. <laughs> and if Blood Rage, rage. If Blood Rage was Cthulhu, I'm not sure how I would feel about that. We'll see. We'll see. 
I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. I've been surprised by a couple of Cthulhu games the last year, so I'll give it a go. Um, it's good. But I'm going to talk about the other game that came out this summer from Greater Than Games' fabled Nexus line. Uh, designer R. Eric Royce. This is Spirit Island. This is a game I completely overlooked multiple times. I overlooked it when there was a chance to back it on Kickstarter. I overlooked it when there was a chance to preview it at Origins. I overlooked it when there was a chance to buy it at Gen Con. I'm not a big cooperative guy, and it seemed like a long, meaty cooperative game. Um, Now, I completely regret overlooking it so many times because now that I've played it, there's a very good chance that this is now among my favorite, if not my favorite, cooperative games. Ever. Ever, period. Ever. This is... This is like the Euro Lovers co-op, and I'll get to why in a moment. But the basic idea of this game is you are a spirit on an island defending against invaders, different colonies or a single colony in the case of a single game that are trying to come and take over this land. So you're basically the other side of every Euro game ever made. Uh, And it... that alone is interesting. That's enough to get me interested in the game. But the actual gameplay here is what's so engrossing for me. Um, each of the spirits, and there are, I think, nine or ten in the box, has a unique power set. You have a unique set of starting cards. You have unique growth options, unique passive abilities. We're not just talking about, like, oh, you have this special power. Everything on that starting card is different. Where you start, how you start, the cards you get how how frequently and often you get energy, how many cards you get to play per turn. It's different for every single one of these. And each of them is scored in a certain way too. On the card or on the board for that spirit, it'll say, you know, this one is more offensive. This one's a low difficulty. This one's higher complexity. This one's more defensive. This one generates more fear. They're all different in their own special way. And that means you have a different feel whenever you play the game. It also means the game is decently complicated that... If you're playing the game cooperatively, there is no uh, innate alpha gamer problem. Um, Everybody's got so many things going on on their own board that you might look up and say, oh, you over there, we need to take care of these guys because if we don't, they're going to build and then they're going to ravage and then we're going to lose. But you're not going to tell them how to do that because you have too much stuff to worry about on your own board. There's a lot going on here. Um, I think one person I talked to before I picked up the game basically called it... uh, the cooperative Terra Mystica. So like that level of complexity in terms of how many things you have to manage and how unique it is for each person. Um, but with a co-op element, which is awesome. So the game actually plays out over three different phases. You have the growth phase where you're going to take an action from your own board. These are different for every single spirit and they'll have all sorts of stuff on them. Some give you new cards. Other lets you reclaim cards. Cause once you've played a card, you can't play it again until you've reclaimed it. Um, you can get additional income. You can place presence on the map. Each presence token, it basically allows you to take actions within a range of that token. You need to place more on the map to extend your range. And once you've done all that, once you've played your cards, each of the cards you play will have either a fast or slow ability. Fast abilities happen pretty much right away. Slow abilities happen later in the round after the invaders act. So they're sometimes more powerful but they don't do you any good if you need to take care of the invaders right now. Then the invaders get to go. So there will be a blight effect. Um, the island starts out healthy, but if the invaders attack often enough, they're going to blight the land, and you can't reverse that. And when it happens, you flip over the card, and a bad thing happens every single round for the rest of the game. So it's going to happen every game. It's almost impossible for it not to happen, but it's a matter of how long can you make it last before it does happen because that's going to be a big factor. Um, Then you're going to play the fear cards. You unlock fear cards by playing things that generate fear. And those cards will stack up in between rounds. This point in the round before the invaders act, you'll play all these cards. The cards will have mostly positive things for you or negative things for the invader, depending on what stage you're at. Then you're going to ravage. So if the invaders have a presence, they're going to deal damage. If they have a presence, they're going to build in the build phase. And then if they are adjacent to a space or it's on the coast, they're going to explore. And then the cards all move forward. Um, Finally, at the end of all that, you're going to use your slow growth cards. So fairly straightforward in terms of how the rounds flow. There's not a ton of stuff going on, but 
there's so many different permutations here, so many different things and that interact with other things. Some of the actions you can take, for example, you can pull things towards you and then push them away. So for example, if you, you're trying to manage how much damage is going to be dealt for each space, you can pull uh, different towns from the invaders towards one single space and then push them out to spread out that damage or move it to an area that isn't going to be damaged because you know in advance what types of terrain are going to be damaged or built on in any given round. It gives you all this information and it lets you plan and it lets you build the system and you can generate this engine that works together to make all this happen. It's it's just such a great game. I don't know how else to say it. Um, and, and the best part about it is that in terms of a solo play, there's no difference. Uh, it scales down perfectly. In the multiplayer game, you just put one island tile out for each player. Solo game, you just put out one. You don't have to play multiple spirits at all. Uh, they're def decently complicated enough that you can play it individually. There are some cards in the deck that influence other players. Just remove those so they're not part of the game. Uh, and there might be a couple spirits that are less interesting than others to play as solo, but I'm personally interested in playing through all of them. Um, there are a ton of difficulty options. There's a intro game, then a base game, normal mode, um, two different colonies in the box that each have their own multiple difficulty levels and then multiple scenarios that you can play through. So lots and lots and lots of different ways to play. Like I said, this is this game blew me away. I was not expecting any of this and I probably still wouldn't have gotten around to playing it if it hadn't gotten you know glowing recommendations from friends. Um, Spirit Island is really, really, really good. And if you are a Euro fan who sometimes is turned off by cooperative games because while they are very thematic, they're not very heavy most of the time, this game solves that for me. It is solidly thematic, solidly complex, and has so much replayability built into the game. There's an expansion that I picked up with it that I haven't even opened yet because there's so much to go through here in the base game. Um, this is one I've had to kind of put aside so that I can get to the other games on my review list. <laughs> and it's, mm -hmm. it keeps calling to me. So this is a great game. Speaking of calling to me, I, so I played the game and my brain was burning at the end of my play of this game. We played a four player game. It took a long time, two hours. I, I played it twice in di two different groups. And like both times, I, what was going on one by like, you know, taking advantage of a couple of cards and not even understanding what else I had in my hand or my, my full powers or whatever, playing like, you know, easier scenarios. Uh, but e even as I was, my brain was burning and that's not usually a, a, a feeling I associate with like, you know, having a fun time, at, at least personally as a gamer, I still want to come back to it. I still was like, oh man, I have to pick this up. It's calling to me again. It's, in, it's, it's hard and in brain burning, but in an inviting way. It's not intimidating. It's like, um, because I, and I think the, the gap is bridged for me because of the theme, because uh, of the invaders. And it's like, you know, there's a little bit of a story that the different zones get. So like, I'm going to stake out this zone. I'm going to let that, that zone suffer to blight. Uh, I'm going to get my little worker meeples, the Dehan or whatever they're called. Uh, still a little bit confused as to how they exactly work. So I, even after two plays, like, mm, did, I get, did I get that right? So you're going to have those feelings. You're still going to be checking the rule book three, four times if you're like me and you're not used to these type of games. But what? I totally agree with Anthony. We are on the same page. This game is a cut above. Um, and it might be a little bit better than Fate of the Other Gods, but that's not to knock either of those games. I think that between those two games, Greater Than Games is killing it. Props to you guys. Yeah, no kidding. This is like when we talked to Chris a few months ago, they knew these games were coming up. We're like, oh, these look interesting. We didn't realize they'd be like this good. Yeah, man. So you got to listen to those episodes, man. <laughs> when, a, when, a, when a designer <laughs> drops a little bit of knowledge towards the end of these episodes, you got to listen to the whole thing. You would have been on the train early. Yes, yes. And a lot of people were. This game totally sold out at Gen Con. People were all over it. All right, guys, so that is uh, all of the games we're going to talk about for this week. Uh, if you did not hear a game that you are interested in hearing about that came out this summer, make sure you check back next week. We'll have seven more reviews. We're going to knock out for you real quick. Um, for now, though, that's going to be everything on this particular episode. Make sure you connect with us in all the different places where we are publishing. You can catch us at ENGN underscore podcast on Twitter. We are on Facebook in the solo 
Board Gaming Group, as well as on the Board Gamers Anonymous Facebook page. Uh, you can catch us on everynightisgamenight.com. That'll take you to the custom channel on boardgamersanonymous.com. Hit us up. Let us know what you think. If you have different opinions or additional thoughts on any of these games, we want to hear about them. Make sure as well that you check out our Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash BGA. We have lots of cool stuff we're putting up there. Uh, probably some additional um, announcements and new things coming up we'll talk about next week. But definitely check that out. Good opportunity for you to join us in the conversation and have a say in future episodes and what we talk about. But for this week, that's going to go ahead and be everything. Uh, until next time, go ahead and grab a solo game off the shelf and let's make every night game night. Later, everybody. Yeah.